I'm so sorry, Mom. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So X-Men 97 showed us a glimpse of mutant utopia before they took it all away from us. So the question is, what happens now? How can the X-Men and the United Nations pick up the pieces from here? A little later, I'm gonna be joined by special guests Tommy Bechtold and Mike Lawrence to get their takes. But first, guys, in honor of Gambit's sacrifice, we have this new Remember It shirt for sale at our merch store where we design all the merch ourselves for you. Now, I love the details in this shirt, like how the Queen of Hearts has hair that looks like rogues. We have lots of other fun X-Men parody merch like the X-Men Club, Doug is Wolverine, X-Men Nighthawks, and our Deadpool MCU savior. Guys, thanks so much for shopping the store and supporting us. It helps us make videos like this one. The link is below. So before we get into what's happening next, let's do a roll call of like what actually happened here. This event, the decimation of Genosha, is adapted from the new X-Men number 115. Cassandra Nova sends an army of Sentinels to wipe out 16 million mutants on Genosha. This visual was actually replicated in episode five. And even in the comic book, this moment is heartbreaking. So wait, who's Cassandra Nova? Does she like make shows on PBS? God, man, she has a weird origin. All right, so she's a parasitic life form from the astral plane who impregnated herself within the womb of Charles Xavier's mother. Then she turned herself into a genetic copy of Charles, so she's basically his evil twin sister. Then the two of them had a psychic battle when she was still in the womb, and Charles won, forcing his mom to miscarry, and then Cassandra spent, like, decades as gunk on the side of a sewer. Okay, so she's just like evil Professor X. You could have just said that. You made it weird. Yes, and she's the villain in the Deadpool movie. So I have a theory that connects X-Men 97 to Deadpool and the greater multiverse saga that I'm gonna talk about in just a bit. But first, let's run through the aftermath of this episode. Gambit, dead. Magneto, Leech, several other Morlocks, presumed dead. Callisto, we literally see the light leave her eyes. Technically, Storm still leads the Morlocks, but she's off being tormented by a demon owl and has no powers. How the tables turn. So the Morlocks now have no leader. Sebastian Shaw, leader of the Hellfire Club and ranking member of the Genosian Council, probably dead. These are some major power vacuums to fill. Remember, Sebastian Shaw is the leader of the secret society of the 1% mutants called the Hellfire Club. They are the Illuminati of mutant kind. In the comics, Shaw at one point was killed by his son Shinobi, which sets off a huge power struggle within the Hellfire Club. So we could see something similar to that happen in this show. Also, Magneto is apparently dead. Now look, he died several times in the comics. There was a really interesting period where he he did reform and lead the X-Men like he does in this show. But then, you know, he backslid and became a villain again, then he died saving the X-Men's lives, but then he returned as a full-on villain. So, we could see something similar here. He could be presumed dead for a while and then return, convinced that humanity can never coexist with his kind, and then he could reform Genosha as its leader like he does in the comics. Cause you know, Magneto being evil is a bad habit that he just can't kick, and I can relate. I got my vices, we all do. Except, mine are like these weird oral fixation habits like constantly using breath mints, or like twisting my face, or clenching my jaw. It's all related to anxiety. But now, I replace that bad gross habit with a positive one by using Fume. They're the sponsor of this video. Oh, is that a vape? This is not a vape. It is not electronic, and it does not have pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals. Instead, it has these plant-based cores that are infused with natural flavors to create natural flavored air. I've been using crisp mint and I love how it freshens my breath. Wow, Bryson, your breath really does smell amazing. Thank you, my friend. You see, Fume uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Plus, it has adjustable airflow and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which frankly is helpful for calming my anxiety. They also just launched the Fume Base. This is a sleek magnetic stand to rest your fume on so you never lose track of it. Guys, Fume makes switching easy and even fun. They have thousands of five-star reviews from more than 150,000 customers who have used Fume to change their lives and help them to switch when other solutions just didn't work. So head to tryfume.com slash screen crush and use the code screen crush to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. The journey pack comes with your choice of three or six unique flavor cores and everything you need to finally be free of your bad habit. That's tryfum.com and use the code screen crush to save an additional 10% off your order today. Now back to the X-Men. Another major move from this era is that the white queen, Emma Frost, joined the X-Men and became romantic with Scott Summers. She began to draw out his dark side, which started to bubble to the surface in this episode. I lie because the truth is we're nothing like you. Thank God, because it's the only reason you people are still alive. But that same era also saw Xavier's school taking on more young students, characters that we see survive the Genosha attack, like Glob Herman and Pixie. So, in the aftermath of this attack, maybe Xavier's school will open its gates and become refugees and become more of like a true school. And also, there's the cable tease. The first time we ever saw this character in the show, he was in Genosha back in season one. Now it looks like he's been trying to prevent the Genosian Holocaust this entire time, even contacting his mom through the astral plane. So that's the basic gist of where everybody is right now, but I am joined by Mike Lawrence and Tommy Bechtold. So Mike, first of all, I just before we talk about what we think could happen, what was your reaction to this episode? 
Yeah, that was awesome. I thought it was great, epic. You know, they're they don't have the same standards in broadcasting uh, <laughs> limits that they did in '92, but they're also not pushing it so far that it's gratuitous. It's it, it feels meaningful. Remember it. No, I thought this was really well done. Um, the relationship dynamics of Rogue and Magneto and and Gambit. I I've never loved Gambit. You know, he always seemed like really creepy to me, and you know, a lot of his advances were never reciprocated on, and it wasn't just because of Rogue's powers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hashtag Mana Me Too. Um, <laughs> You know, he's always, he always felt like just, yeah, a little scummy. Like, even as a kid, I was like, ugh. But, um, no, but, but they really uh, redeemed him here. And this was an awesome, it's so, it's so funny to, like, have the best episode of a character be the one where they die. <laughs> but it happens, it, though. It happened in The yeah, Walking Dead it, all the time. As soon as a character, you got to know them, like, well, they're going to be gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, you know, and it's always, like, playing cards and soda cans and shit. And, you know, him using his powers to this level here was amazing. I mean, dude, just as a as a Jew watching Magneto fight Nazi robots with a train was unbelievable. Oh, God. I didn't even pick up on that. I just thought, okay, he's using it as a whip. And I picked up yeah, the slavery he... of Genosha and apartheid. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He rode a train on that Sentinel. <laughs> nah, it was it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, the action in this, like I, the the Madeline Pryor, Jean Grey stuff is still like, you know, I didn't read that stuff when it came out. I was a uh, early '90s to late '90s, so whenever I see clones, I think Spider Man, and I get uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, and so clones are always never my thing. But I think they're doing that well. They're, you know, they're making a meal of it. You know, Cyclops getting angry in the interview was cool. Um, no, this thing has a real, real purpose to it. You know, the last time I was here was episode three. You know, last week we had this like fun detour with Mojo. You know, we had this emotional, small, very small story with life, death, and then you had this big epic here. And um, you know, this is the halfway point. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen, and I think that's, you know, that's what you want as a fan. So I think it's yeah. awesome. I don't, I don't think anyone could have predicted what this episode would be. We just saw the title, Remember It, and we knew that's a gambit phrase. But that's all we knew, and, and I think that that's good. As, as much as there is all this information out there and spoilers and shit, like, to, to feel like a kid again and go into something blind is what you want. And, uh, yeah, I love this episode. You know, Tommy, uh, after I watched, like, I, I had to, we worked late the night before getting the Joker video up, right? And I was well wound up, had a hard time getting to sleep, woke up super early to do X-Men. I was exhausted. And then I had to go through this emotional catharsis of watching this. And I was explaining it to my wife later on. We were walking Doug, and I, I tried to explain what happened in the episode. And I got to the part where I said, and then he turns to Leech, and in German says, don't be, and I just lost it, like on the walk with three hours sleep. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, Mike, like you said, as a Jew, has to resonate on a lot of different levels. Uh, yeah. Tommy, what was your, your gut reaction to this, apart from vehemently disagreeing with uh, Mike on Gambit? Yeah, He's I'm all about uh, touchy feely creeps. That, that's that's my uh, those are my uh, iconoclasts. But I uh, yeah no I, I I thought this episode I, I echo Mike's sentiments uh, largely across the board. I thought it was excellent. I thought it it took in in an animated series it took the steps that shows like Game of Thrones and Walking Dead often did by having these epic huge high stakes episodes right in the center of the season with ramifications that can echo through now five more episodes rather than Tommy, just... would you would you say this was their Omega Red Wedding? I I thought this was like their hard home where like the shit just hit the fan <laughs> in a major way and it was like yeah. but that would be an Omega I I I, I uh I, an Omega Red Wedding should happen between uh, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, Cyclops and um, 
and uh, Madeline Pryor get together and Jean. But if this show in. goes for so many, with for ten more seasons, the writers' room will start doing that. They'll That's have right. the board up with like, okay, we got Omega Red, we got Magic, we teased her in this yes. episode. No, Yana was a baby, but now, who knows where they can take it? But like, yes. you know, Mike, it's like you said though, knowing the comics. I, I looked at the episode titles and I was like, okay, it'll be a Gambit episode. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, and Genosha, that'll pay off at the end because it's Extinction. There's Extinction Agenda. There's a E is for Extinction from the Grant Morrison run. I did not think they were going to hit us this early. And uh, mm -hmm. the co-creator of the show, speaking of uh, <laughs> Mon Me too, he said that episode five was the one that changes everything. It was their 9-11, their Tulsa, and everything before was supposed to be filled with like happy, feel-good uh, nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So... Tommy, was there, as a Gambit fan, do you feel like the show as a whole, like even through the animated series, was doing him justice up to this point? And how did you feel about finally getting to see him use his powers for something other than soda cans and chains? Well, I, I think much more so this iteration. You know, it's, it, Mike actually brings up an interesting point, I think. Like the 90s X-Men, where I was like a teenager... Not to throw the, the dreaded, and I don't believe this, but the phrase would be like, the justification for that character by the adults in the 90s would be like, well, that wasn't as, like a, that wasn't as frowned upon. Like a pushy man was not being called out. So I didn't really register that. I was like, oh, this dude's just like really loud and confident. And now like looking back on it, you know, things don't, often don't age well when you watch them with an adult lens. I felt this season he was more vulnerable the, the, mm -hmm. in 97 his his kind of like inability like inability to hide his heartbreak over what's going on with rogue despite all the machismo despite all the toxic masculinity if you will was i thought really kind of compelling storytelling that i wasn't necessarily expecting so yeah i think i think he he was done well this season uh and maybe not so much in the past if i can well, yeah, i've read the I've read the original show Bible that the Lulds wrote, and they describe Gambit, you know, to incoming writers, as he's, you know, a ladies' man. Like, mm -hmm. not that he's this pervy guy who hits some people. Yeah, like, they were right. trying to write him as, you know, this first scene in the whole show. Mm -hmm. He's in the mall, and he's mm -hmm. flirting with the lady, and she's like, you like what you see? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe she's just trying to sell yeah. the guy a fancy deck of cards. <laughs> I don't sure, know. Like, sure. Now that I think about it, why is he having to go in and talk to a sales clerk about buying a deck of cards? So clearly there was some flirting going on there and they wanted to talk to each other to begin You're with. Right. Um, yeah, he's a character who I think he was included in the original show because of his balance with Rogue. You know, everyone in the original lineup that they did in, the, in 92 X-Men was there for a specific reason. They slotted in in a specific way that made the team dynamic work because they experimented. They took people out and said, what kind of storylines here? And Gambit was also an extremely popular character who he was, was a one of the newer character. characters, you know. Like, Very new. He comes even after Jubilee. Like, it, it, it's mm -hmm. crazy. He was, so he was probably the newest member of the X-Men at that time. Um, and, and it's fascinating because it's like, yeah, he was always such a mess to me, um, just of, like, the name, you know, it's like, there's, mm -hmm. I remember reading, um, like, Wizard Magazine, now, that was a fun book. Mm. Oh, yeah, they would, hell yeah. But they would always I, say, I, like, I you know, you should be able, like, a lot of times, you can look at the name of a character and know who they are, and it's like, there is nothing about Gambit, the trench coat and the weird cyber mm -hmm. chest mm -hmm. plate, and, I mean, there's, like, you know, the red eyes, like, it's just... It's like nine different ideas. Like it, it, he is like a. You're right. He's like an amalgamation. He's dressed like he belongs in Tron, and then he has a duster on, and then he and he also wears like a karate headband. Which, you know, obviously, I, I'm not going to be throwing stones in my glass house. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, you know, there's a. I think the one thing that they did, they they really kind of underexplore is like his past as a thief. Like I know in the original series, it was touched on more. It's, but it's, a, like, it's a pronounced thief. He's a thief. You're right. He's a we gotta give him the tithe. If you watch <laughs> that episode, they say tithe. It's like yeah. the the best drinking game if you want to yes. get absolutely wrecked. And yeah, then that again. episode is like like peak like mystery science theater like silly goofy. You know, it's really it's is. it's a fun episode, but it is like it's the one that focuses on him the most, and it's kind of uh, not the best. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, I actually think the best I ever saw Gambit done, period, was uh, a two or three solo run in Ultimate X-Men. Did you guys ever mm -hmm. read that? Where he's oh. basically doing three-card Monty on the streets of New Orleans. Yeah, was that, did, was that the one that uh, uh, Scott Gimple wrote? 
I think so. Mike, do you remember? Yeah. Did, were you, yeah, were you that, was that, that was early, right? And he fights Hammerhead. Very. Yeah, Within the first was... year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read yeah, that, that and I was like, like, well, that's your Gambit movie. That's the most interesting he's ever been. He's like protecting this little girl and stuff. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's that was way really more interesting one. to me. Yes, I enjoy that. Yeah. I, they should adapt that. Get Channing Tatum back. He's only been waiting 15 years. Come on. He can, what, he can wait but a Mike, you, longer. You brought up an interesting point that he was the last person to join the X, or one of the more recent additions, but I think in the X-Men animated series, I think he was the last person to join the team because he, they don't know anything about him. Like when Bishop shows up and he's like, yeah, this guy is going to assassinate the senator. They're like, oh, bit, you know, Gambit, you wouldn't do that. Like they totally buy into this because they mm -hmm. don't know him yet. And I do, you know, like you said, we learn the most about the guy that the when he dies, but in our Easter egg video, I pointed out that him and Rogue, because they're both Southerners, have this like simmering Bible chastity belt tension between them where mm -hmm. it's it's like something written out of the, the True Blood series, you know, where they mm -hmm. can't be together kind of thing. So and I loved how they just, as grown-ups, had a conversation about that because you never get to see comic book characters in animation especially just sitting down mm -hmm. and talking to each other as human beings who have emotions. I can't touch you, Remy. Your heart may beat for me, but I can't feel it. It's it, you know it's fascinating that like the you know like anti woke or whatever it is you know people who were like so happy that this this uh, Bo DeMeo guy got fired just mm -hmm. because of like the pictures that he was like you know posting of himself and you know like the OnlyFans and, and all of that like and now it's like we're seeing his work it's really really good <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and i saw he posted this thing that you know was really powerful about um you know being someone who frequented pulse nightclub in orlando and how um that's what that genosha scene was for him mm. and you know that that's why he wanted to show this like big party and this celebration and stuff i mean like that was it was a thing with, like when I'm watching this, and I, I I didn't know that Ace of Base song, but the second I heard, it, I'm like, that sounds like Ace of Base, like, and I was like, and this is too good of a song to be a song they made. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was really, catchy. yeah, very much so, yeah. The chanting no, and all that, it was it was so beautifully yeah, done. No shade to the Newton brothers, I think they're actually doing fantastic. Uh, yeah, they are, but the, the that, score, that but I know like what a, you mean proper pop song yeah and yeah. um but and the way that they did that with the music stopping and everything and and I'm reading from the writer himself of like what that meant to him and, and everything Oof. i i hope that the even the same people that were gloating for this guy to to lose his job are asking for him to be brought back because this guy really um understands these characters and really um, is thinking about the audience and, you know, and he's using the metaphors well, but he's also including the superhero parts. Like one of my favorite moments in this episode was just when Scott uh, says, you know, we've saved you from evil mutants, robots and space aliens. <laughs> we saved the universe, literally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I like, love to. Yeah. I love that getting to finally see a little bit more dimension to Scott. Uh, I mean, I always, I always say he's my favorite X-Man because he's the Boy Scout, because he's the rock that they all lean on. But the comics, and I'll be honest, runs I haven't fully read, did take him in interesting places where he becomes like a little more of an anti-hero and leader of Genosha. I can't talk about the quality of those because I haven't read them, but on paper, it's interesting. And uh, a little bit earlier, I speculated that maybe Emma, you know, as if the Hellfire Club has been decimated, might do what she does in the comics and come over to Xavier's Institute because now they're lacking leadership. And that's, you know, Tommy, you compare this to the Red Wedding. I think that's a great analogy because the Red Wedding happened halfway through Game of Thrones and it was a demarcation before and after. Like there was definitely like there is before that, there's after that. It's like, this is like a seismic change the size of giant size X-Men. So given that and everything that we know as fans from the comics and things we you know, know could happen, where do you think they're gonna go from here? I mean, I've even, like, I think Bo DeMaio even said that episode eight is, like, the real gut punch. And I'm like, worse? Oh, my God, that's terrifying. That's that's a that's a, a breaking news to me. And now I, I literally just, like, my heart just sank a little bit. I'm like, oh, God, it's going to get worse. Uh, yeah. Or not worse, but, you know, uh, more more devastating. You know, I, I think there's, like, 
we have the warning from Cable, right? He is coming, mm-hmm. and it's like I think that where we're going from here is who is he? And we're also probably going to get some of the, you know, the the survivor, the, the picking up the pieces, the survivor, all, all the struggle to survive, the survivor's guilt, all of those things. We're going to see a kind of a, a a a group of people that are now devastated by this horrific attack, and and see the global reaction, and you know what kind of how are the how are the uh, non mutants going to react? My guess is negatively and poorly, but uh, you know. What 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 are the next steps for Genosha now? Is there even like I mean, is it just basically like the UN moves in? Like this was like a this is a very convenient uh, reason for the UN to kind of occupy Genosha and, and instill the leaders that they want there rather than uh, Magneto. I feel like there's going to be just a lot of uh, it's going to be a chaos, right? There's like a vacuum now, uh, and it's like I think we're going to be dealing with the mo- the mourning of the people that were lost, trying to make sense of it. And also trying to figure out because this threat is not gone; it's coming back. And what do they mm-hmm. need to do? Who who is left to fight? That's kind of what it always is, right? Like in, in any in any big epic, it's like who who's going to survive to episode ten for the big boss? Well, and who and who are they fighting? Mike, what about yeah. you? What do you think about the future of the show after this? You know, it's tough because it's like I don't want them to to backpedal on anything because mm-hmm. then you lose a lot of stakes. But it was you know, it's like. Their version of Magneto, to me, has been the definitive version of Magneto. You know, don't still don't love the costume, <laughs> but but it's cool. They're doing their best. They're doing their best with what they were given. <laughs> oh yeah, they're leaning into it. They're, they're, they're having fun, and you know, but he's such a, a great character. You know, the moment from last week when. You know, Jubilee's like, what, did your parents not get you a pony? He's like, my parents were killed as children. (laughs) He's so, he's so, like, um, they understand him so well, and the seriousness and the grimness and and all of that, um, and the regalness. And uh, so, but, you know, yeah, that moment with, you know, with with the Morlocks was so impactful that it's like, I don't want to lose that. But... I'm going to miss him, you know. Um, I'm going to miss Gambit a little bit. That's how good he was. I don't think Magneto for a second is dead, though. I mean, I think that, like, going back to early 90s X-Men, he died for a long time and then came back, you know, more evil than ever, like I was talking about earlier. I think they very purposefully don't show the body. He also does this weird thing. A guy who comes on the channel, Mike Mazzola, pointed out to me, he kind of teleports in at one point next to night. There's, like, a weird, so he's, like, in a bubble, and he, like, teleports in. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think without a body, he's definitely coming back. But uh, like I said, I, I, me too. Um, which which I love, and and yeah. he was great in this episode. And it, he he's got an action figure in the second wave. So I think um, uh. I do want to. You know, I'm missing morph. I want more morph. Yes. Um, taking a center stage. Him him having to be serious now. I think is going to be a fun thing. I think mm-hmm. yeah. What's going to happen is. Um, you know, it's tough. Like, I think, I think the idea of Cassandra Nova is interesting to me. If that's where they go, based on the original storyline, because it's like, I don't know. I mean, God, I I could already see the YouTube comments coming. But Apocalypse is always like a hype man, but he never fully lives up. Like, I just remember even like being a kid, and you know, he's like this big bad. He has an A on his tummy, which is mm-hmm. f- stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very silly that he has his own initial on his <laughs> body. And then and then you're like, you know, it's that whole thing like in The Simpsons when they're like, oh, that little guy, you don't know what he's going to do. And then he gets thrown yes. through the window. I remember Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, Apocalypse, what's he going to do? And then he just turns his hand into a mallet. <laughs> and he grows really big. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're like, gives a good it? speech. I, well, look, but I kind of feel like, I mean, I know in season in season five, they did a little thing where Apocalypse, the spirit comes back. I thought season four had like the definitive Apocalypse storyline for this universe, right? Where he was... Uh, beyond Good and Evil? Yeah, yeah. The, the four-parter where it was meant to end the whole series mm-hmm. where he's like at the center of time and, you know, it, like Kang shows up at the end of it. Very cute. Um, Sinister, I think, is more set up to be him. I mean, if anybody was behind, if it's not Cassandra Nova, I could see him wanting to thin the mutant gene pool. Like, if I can't control the mutants, then no one can. 
Plus, that would be explain why Morph is with the team. There's, you know, Scott and Madeline. I think that's probably where the connective tissue is going to be. Plus, I mean, they never resolved things with him. He even got an entire flashback episode in season five that just showed mm -hmm. his origin. But he was a big, he was the main threat in season two. And then we haven't really had him as an antagonist, a main antagonist since. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he was in Inferno. And, but, but the way he was defeated felt like, like a red herring thing. It was like so easy that that's obviously mm -hmm. not the end of him. I would I would be excited about that. I mean, you know, I, I I just think that it's yeah, it's like where they go from here and what they do with the character dynamics, you know, who's left, like the, the fun of all of that. Seeing um you know, even seeing like Jubilee and Roberto debating last episode mm -hmm. about the seriousness of this and, mm -hmm. and, and watching like Roberto come into his own. I, I think that yeah, this is gonna be like they're making it really epic, and and I think we're gonna. I think our like Infinity War, like holy, you know, crap moment is gonna be Storm raining down yes. with all her powers back, and that's mm -hmm. gonna be a really cool, like amazing. And that, that's a whole thing too, because the story with the adversary in the comics is yeah. weird. <laughs> it's so oh, yeah. weird. It's very weird. She's. I mean, it's. She and Forge are in another dimension, and it, this whole thing, and he uses his leg to make a new gun to give her powers back, but then the adversary has to kill them to undo his spell, but then they get the Siege Perilous, and they can fake their deaths, and camera, like, you, but they do the thing job about, of simplifying stuff. Yeah, that's what I mean, like, that's why I'm excited to see them take elements of all of these, yeah. and when you talk about, you know, Tommy, you said Cable said he is coming, did he say that to Madeline, or was that, like, the whirlwind vision of Cable? Yeah, I, well, I think he said it to... When he was giving Madeline the warning to turn off the music, like he was like, turn off okay, the music. Okay, I missed that. Music. He is coming, and then, sorry, Mom, I think was the last thing he said. Gotcha, okay. I think he said something similar when he appeared as a whirlwind in episode one, which I can look mm -hmm. back now and say that whirlwind was the time vortex mm -hmm. from season two that changes the past. I love this, too, because, look, you know, Mike, you've, you know, you're, you're dunk, you dunk on the original series a lot for obvious reasons, budget and limitations and network limitations. Um... They never teased a mystery this well. Mm -hmm. Like, this is genuinely, this is like what we all wanted the live action Marvel shows to be. <gasps> Who's the power broker? Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Who is yes. this? You know? Oh my God. What? And yes. then they just always get kind of dropped on the floor and they're, you yeah. know, I don't blame them for Mephisto. That was our fault. That's on us. I get mm -hmm. that one. But all the others, you have to admit, they, they thought they had to tease a big mystery. But this one, I'm genuinely like, look, man, I know these comics. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know who he is. Probably yeah, Sinister, he but. I think, yeah, so far, yeah, this is the best season of the show. And, and I, I think it's only getting there better. Like, you know, and, you know, there 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 are, you know, some of those campy elements from the original that, that just make it fun. Like, the joyousness of this, like, was really awesome. And I don't, th I don't think the end of this episode means what it does if you didn't have all of those scenes at the beginning. Oh, absolutely. And yep. especially episode four of this season... You know, just getting to see some fun mojo stuff, you know, and relive all the glory days. And there's Wolverine yeah. in his black T-shirt from the original show. Yeah. Um, the you need to be set up all of this thing. stuff. It's not one of these things or one of these things. When, mm. they, when they make a movie, you know, and they just like, it's got to be just this. We love it because, all you know, we love the adversary and all these silly things and, you know, the brood. and <laughs> The Macron oh, yeah. crystal, yeah. I'm yeah, gonna miss Leech. I'll tell you what. I mean, I Le poor Leech. He, the entire Lady oh. Deathstrike uh, episode from what was it, season f four, three, or three. season three, three, uh, where she has the opportunity to kill him fifty times and never does. She just keeps putting him in that restraint thing, and it's like you just keep thinking like Leech is gonna die, and then he goes out. This, he survives all of that. Just to go out this way. Now, now, here's my only, you know, nerd, but actually here is, what is Leech's powers on this show? Because yeah. how, what is the vicinity and how, you know, when Magneto's like shielding him, but pushing Rogue away with the metal, should Magneto's powers even work around Leech? I, I mm. think if, 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 the, if the showrunners were here to answer the question, it would be that Leech is the reason he's not able to stop the machine that like it's limiting him that's what i kind of took from it because i don't think they would have had leech be there if Leech, because in season one with the more i think he takes scott's right it's just like immediate um i i think that's where they were going with it could but because magneto is an omega level mutant maybe you know that's the reason why uh -huh, well i feel like i get a no prize for that 
Last question for you guys. Do you think Charlie is going to come back from space uh, kind of like dad coming in and watching all the kids mess up the house and say, what the heck is going on here? Or is he actually dead? I, I think, I mean, I would be shocked if he doesn't come back at the end of the season. I, I, I guess I could see that they, they could, you know, they're going in a different direction and it doesn't like, it doesn't have to be Charles Xavier doesn't have to exist for the X-Men to exist. Uh, is a weird thing to say, but it's true. Uh, but it so, but I, I, I really do believe for the sake of this show, uh, I would like him to come back. For the sake of Tom Bechtold, I would like him to come back. <laughs> I, I, I just like the character. I like, uh, I think, it, I want to see his reaction to all that has happened, to everything that has occurred, and, you know, who's been lost, and, and who has joined. I... I think he's existing somewhere in someone's brain. He's hiding in someone's mind right now, and I think we just got to get him his body. We got to get his, his summer body. We got to get him to the gym and get him his summer body back. All right, Tommy, Mike, I got to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining me. And now I'm going to tell you guys how I think this show is going to lead directly into Deadpool and Wolverine. So I mentioned earlier that Cassandra Nova is the villain in Deadpool. It even looks like we see her here in the void at the end of time. Well, what if in this show we get to see her origin? We did see Uatu, the Watcher, in the sky above Genosha, solidifying that this show is part of the Marvel multiverse. So what if Cassandra Nova is actually the one behind this attack like she is in the comics? Then the X-Men can defeat her, and with the help of Bishop or Cable, they could prune her. Do you say right now? Well, back in season two, Bishop traveled back in time to stop a plague. His actions caused a time vortex in Cable's far future, and we even see Cable's son disappear. Help me, Dad! So what if the time vortex is just another way of pruning objects and sending them to the void at the end of time? So if Cable is successful and is able to stop Cassandra Nova, maybe he had to travel back in time, change her past, and then this created a time vortex. He would prune her from existence and send her to the void where she would become the villain in Deadpool. Well, guys, big thanks to Mike Lawrence and Tommy Bechtold for coming in today and talking to me. You can find their social links below, but let me know what you thought of the episode. Are you okay? Please let me know if you're not okay. You can let me know down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.